Hello everyone, welcome back, and today we're looking at B2.1, which is membranes and membrane transport in IV biology. So let's get started. First of all, we're going to look at what is the cell membrane made out of. It's made out of lipid bilayers. Remember, we looked at this in B1.1, so I'll link that up above. But the plasma membrane is essential. Why? Because it acts as a barrier between a cell and its environment. Membranes also allow for organelles, which can have different functions within the cell to exist. So organelles also have a plasma membrane um, around them. So remember, the phospholipid bilayer is made of a phosphate head and two hydrocarbon tails, and basically it allows for low permeability to hydrophilic molecules such as glucose, and also very large molecules. Um, so we have both hydrophilic or hydrophobicity and the molecular size as things determining permeability. However, things can go across the membrane. So first we have simple diffusion. So simple diffusion is spreading out that happens naturally just because particles are in continuous random motion. The thing is more particles move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. That's called movement down the concentration gradient. And it's important to understand that this is a passive process. There's no energy required for this. So simple diffusion can only happen if the bilayer is permeable to particles. This means that it will mostly happen with nonpolar or hydrophobic particles, which pass through the membrane much more easily, such as oxygen. As we said, glucose, this is unlikely to happen with because it does not, uh, it's not very permeable to it. Membranes also have proteins in them, and the more active a membrane is overall, the more its protein content will be. This differs a lot from cell type to cell type. And the orientation of proteins is very important for their function. So there's two main groups, integral and peripheral. So integral proteins are hydrophobic on at least part of their surface and are therefore embedded within the membrane, right? They're close to the hydrocarbon chains in the center of the membrane. Many are transmembrane, meaning they extend across and project on both sides. On the other hand, peripheral are hydrophilic in their surface. Remember that globular proteins resemble that. So they will not be embedded in the membrane. And most of them will be either attached to the phosphate heads or to the surface of integral proteins. Another type of movement is osmosis. So osmosis can be defined as the net movement of water molecules. That means more water molecules move in one direction than the other. Now, why does this happen? Because of differences in the concentration of substances dissolved in water. Intermolecular bonds with dissolved substances restrict the movement of water molecules. Therefore, regions with more solute have less water free to move. So water will normally move from regions of lower concentration to regions with higher solute concentration. And again, this is a passive movement. So water can pass through the phospholipid bilayer, but sometimes aquaporins can increase membrane permeability to water. They're basically channels which, which just allow water to pass through. Another type of transport is facilitated diffusion. Why do we need this? Well, because some molecules, as we saw, hydrophilic molecules such as ions or glucose cannot pass through the phospholipid bilayer. They require proteins that act as channels. These are normally integral and transmembrane proteins which have a pore inside them. And the diameter and chemical properties of the pore will ensure that only one type of particle passes through. So channels actually allow particles to pass in either direction, but normally there's a net movement from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, so down the concentration gradient. And this is because no energy is being expended here. It's passive, so it just follows the normal laws of diffusion. Um, and channels can be open or closed to change permeability when necessary. Then we have active transport. So active transport is basically going against the concentration gradient, and therefore it requires energy. It requires pump proteins. These use ATP normally, and they allow to move only in one direction, which again, as I mentioned, is against the concentration gradient. They normally have two different conformations, so they can enter the pump to reach the central chamber, and then they change to the other conformation, allowing the molecule to pass to the opposite side. You can see that here, right? The sodiums can enter here, after which there's a conformational change allowing them to pass to the other side. And then similarly with potassium, the same happens here. And ATP is utilized in the process. So based on what we've looked at, we can classify these methods as selective or non-selective. So selectivity means allowing the passage of some particles, but not others. So channel proteins and pump proteins, that is facilitated diffusion and active transport, are selective, whereas simple diffusion and osmosis are not selective. They simply depend on the size and polarity of molecules. Then, 
And this is a bit of a random uh, topic to include here, but it's in the syllabus. So glycoproteins and glycolipids. So glycoproteins, remember, are proteins with a carbohydrate attached to them. And they are often found in the plasma membrane as well, with the carbohydrate projecting into the exterior. You can see that here, right? It's projecting to the outside. These were described in B1.1, so I won't go into a lot of detail. Glycolipids are very similar. They're lipids with a carbohydrate attached. And they're also found in the membrane with a carbohydrate projecting outward. Um, these are also involved in self recognition um, and they can help the immune system distinguish between self and non self. But, anyways, what's the point? So, the glycocalyx is the layer of carbohydrates that forms outside of the plasma membrane. And the glycocalyx of adjacent cells can fuse, binding cells together and preventing tissue from falling apart. So, what you see here actually is tons of different cells here in the rim that have their glycocalyxes fused together, right, forming this big structure. If you see that, right, this is two micrometers, whereas this is 0 0.2. So this is one individual cell, whereas this is tons of different cells joined together. Okay, and finally, for the SL ones, this is the fluid mosaic model. So this is the current model, uh, and it states that the plasma membrane is made of a bilayer of phospholipids with proteins in a variety of positions, and that the phospholipid molecules can move laterally as well as the proteins, making it, therefore, fluid. And you can see everything we've talked about, right? Glycoproteins, uh, uh, well, we haven't talked about cholesterol, that's in HL, but glycolipids, peripheral proteins, integral proteins, plus some other stuff that you don't have to worry about. Okay, so now... For those in HL, let's carry on. Okay, so to begin with, you need to understand that the bilayer can have different compositions depending on the fatty acids that are in them. We looked at this in B1.1, but let's recap. So saturated fatty acids have straight chains, so they pack very tightly in bilayers, reducing the fluidity of the membrane and giving them higher melting points. Unsaturated fatty acids have these kinks in them, which make them pack much more loosely, making the membranes more fluid flexible and permeable and giving them lower melting points. So relative amounts of each of these need to be regulated so that membranes have the required properties. They must be permeable but not too permeable and the ideal ratio normally depends on the temperature uh, that a cell experiences. So for example fish from Antarctic waters have a higher percentage of unsaturated fatty acids because they're in a very very cold environment. Okay so cholesterol. I mentioned it before. So cholesterol makes up 20 to 40% of lipids in the plasma membrane. It is a steroid, and most of it is hydrophobic. So it's attached to the center of the membrane, and it'll be positioned well, between the phospholipids, right? If you don't remember all of this, go back to B1.1, because it will explain a lot of the concepts in this topic. So the fluidity of membranes needs to be controlled to regulate which substances can pass through. And cholesterol basically maintains an orderly arrangement of phospholipids, so it stabilizes the membranes at higher temperatures, but it also ensures that it does not solidify at lower temperatures. It's a regulator of rigidity. Okay, moving on to endocytosis and exocytosis. So vesicles are, as you can see here, small sacs of membrane with a droplet of fluid inside, and they can have other stuff as well. And they can be formed from the plasma membrane when the plasma membrane invaginates, right? So this happens with the help of proteins and ATP, and this is called endocytosis. So this contains water and solutes from outside the cell, and this that can then move the materials around the cell. But vesicles can then also fuse with the plasma membrane, allowing to release its contents outside, and that is called exocytosis. So it's another type of membrane transport. Another type of channels. So we have voltage-gated channels. These are very simple concepts. So voltage-gated channels, for example, sodium channels, are controlled by voltage. Uh, so both they have a reversible conformation uh, where the subunits can change. Either they're open or they're closed. And that just depends on the voltage, right? And then here we have a neurotransmitter-gated channel. So neurotransmitter-gated channels, a good example is nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are found in neuronal synapses. And basically, when a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, binds, this receptor has a conformational change, opening a pore so that sodium can pass as well. So as you can see, in both cases, the channel allows sodium to pass, but in one of them, it's voltage-gated, whereas in the other one, it's neurotransmitter-gated. Hopefully that makes sense. Then we also have exchange transporters. So this will sound familiar because I put it in the SL, because it's a form of active transport as well. But more specifically, it's an exchange transporter. So they transport different ions in opposite directions. They're very important in creating a membrane potential in neurons for um, 
nervous impulses to occur. But it also requires active transport, right? So this is an example of the sodium-potassium pump. Uh, it's a good example. So it's a cycle whereby three sodium ions are pumped out and two potassium ions are pumped in. And again, ATP over here, which you can see, is required. Great. Another type, indirect active transport. So the example here is sodium glucose transporters, co-transporters. They transfer a sodium ion and a glucose molecule together into a cell. So the glucose molecule can move against its concentration gradient because the sodium ion is moving down its concentration gradient. It basically utilizes the energy released in the movement of the sodium to move the glucose. And this is used, for example, in the kidney uh, to reabsorb glucose to prevent it being lost in urine, and also in the small intestine to absorb digested glucoses. However, a lot of times it requires pumping sodium out in the first place to generate that gradient. As I said, right, the sodium moves down a gradient, but for that to happen, there needs to be a gradient in the first place. So ATP is required to form that sodium gradient so that then both can pass through at the same time. Okay, finally, we need to look at cell adhesion molecules or CAMs, right? So cells and tissue are normally linked together by cell-to-cell -cell junctions, and this requires CAMs. So CAMs are normally embedded in the phospholipid bilayer, as you can see here, um, and their domains extend into the extracellular environment. They form a junction between adjacent cells, which can bind together. And all you need to know is that different types of CAMs make different types of junction, depending on the required function but um, they can have very diverse functions. They can prevent the movement of substances or cells or facilitate it depending on, on the CAMs we have, okay? Amazing, so if everything's understood, that's great. Otherwise, leave some questions in the comments, but let's do some questions. So first, what is the main function of cholesterol in the cell surface? This should be an easy one. I'll give you three seconds, three, two, and one. It's to regulate membrane fluidity, right? It does not provide hydrophilic channels at all. It's embedded in the membrane. It does not assist active transport. It's a lipid. Um, and it does not assist a, a cell adhesion. It does not protrude out of the membrane either. It regulates membrane fluidity. And finally, which of the following describes the model of membrane structure now widely accepted? This was the final topic in SL. Hopefully you remember. Again, three, two, and one. Feel free to pause here. A. So it's a phospholipid bilayer with a series of proteins that are free to move around within the membrane. It is a phospholipid bilayer, right, but that does not describe it entirely here in C. In terms of B, they're not fixed. They don't have fixed positions. They can move its fluid, the fluid mosaic model, that's how it's called, and the, it does not have a layer of proteins on either side. The proteins are embedded throughout or on the surface at distinct points. So therefore, it is A. So I hope this was of use. If you have any questions, again, Leave it in the comments and I'll see you next week for the next topic. Bye everyone.